Well, Tom, forgive us if we get started because it, uh, the evening is moving along because it's an extremely important migratory point uh, for three varieties of crane. And there is a foundation um, whose uh, focus is the, the preservation and, um, uh, and thriving of, uh, of, of this uh, bird. And, um, uh, oh, and, uh, and also into that mix uh, is uh, residents of one kind or another in southern Vermont. And um, uh, there, are, there are two such members of this network present this evening, our speaker, uh, Donald Gregg, and um, uh, board member, Emeritus Arthur Westing. Um, and um, so at, uh, um, with Arthur's um, help, we have been able to secure the talk by Donald this evening. And I'm um, asking Arthur just to say a few words of introduction. Um, and can uh, um, retreat and, um, and, and give the evening over to, the, uh, to this subject. Uh, just let me say that uh, the February program will be Dr. Renata uh, Gabau on uh, talking on Nepal. March um, will be marking International Women's Day uh, with a variety of people coming back to talk about um, experiences uh, in, in the women's movement and, uh, and the Peace Corps. April, um, there'll be a team from SIT talking about social action in Wyndham County. And other subjects as we go further into the year include Bolivia and Russia, Turkey, and Ukraine. Uh, oh, and also let me say that we, uh, we, can, we are supporting this new uh, program at the high school of the United Nations, of the uh, Mock United Nations program, and five, um, five of the young people there will be taking part in a regional Mock United Nations that's taking place in Amherst in, um, in March, um, and we're very proud to be uh, instrumental in, in getting that going, and we did at the last meeting um, undertake to, to um, sponsor this, um, the, uh, the travel and other expenses of this program. And we, uh, it's only the start of the things we want to do to get more engaged with youngsters and their natural interest in the, in the wider world. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Arthur, would you care to introduce our guest to us? It's a privilege to do so. Um, I have um, not known Donald Gregg uh, since we moved to Westminster West in the 60s and were sort of neighbors for a long time but somehow never connected. Um, on the other hand, uh, we did connect through the Korea Society probably about the mid-1990s. Um, I've been very much involved in trying to protect the demilitarized zone in Korea uh, as a, a nature reserve. And I've done this uh, together with Paul Healy here and two or three other people, and we got an enormous amount of help through the Korea Society, where Donald Gregg uh, was then the director and then subsequently the chairman. <coughs> and uh, he was enormously useful uh, to our efforts. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to say that he is a, a respected and good friend of ours now. Um, he, he has spent an illustrious career uh, starting at Williams College um, where he got his bachelor's degree and I mention that because he's run full circle uh, <laughs> Uh, where he is now a uh, visiting professor teaching a course on uh, the politics of the intelligence community, if I've got that right. Uh, in between, he spent uh, three decades in the Central Intelligence Agency. He has also been the ambassador uh, to uh, South Korea. He was a national security advisor to the good Bush, yeah. <laughs> and um, so on and so forth. Let me say um, just one or two more things. We're fortunate uh, that um, 
Donald Gregg has written an autobiography or his memoir called Pot Shards, which I can recommend very highly. And so uh, for those of you who have not yet read this book, you have a wonderful opportunity uh, to do so in the future. This, this is your book. And I want to say something about the CIA. Um, I, um, it's gotten a bad reputation lately because of its involvement with nasty things like torture. Uh, but this fellow has spent a lifetime um, trying to prevent the CIA from doing nasty things of that sort. In fact, quite a few years ago, uh, he went way out on a limb um, during his career in the agency um, in opposition to torture and almost uh, lost his position as a result. Uh, my own involvement with the CIA is uh, something I don't want to talk about too much, uh, except to say that I was involved in the anti-war movement um, to some extent during the Vietnam <coughs> era, and subsequently I sent for my, um, through the Freedom of Information Act, I sent for my FBI files and the CIA files. And I got back a sort of an inch thick stack from each. Let me say that the FBI files were riddled with errors and that there wasn't a single mistake in the CIA files. <laughs> and so let me conclude by saying uh, something incredible that happened just this evening. Donald Gregg with a number of the board members um, and friends had uh, dinner at Panda North and he got his fortune and you won't believe this. He says, don't take your talks too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh and smile once in a while and don't repeat yourself. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> What am I supposed to be talking about? <laughs> well, I don't know. Is there a title to it? Yes, there was. <laughs> Can anybody remember what the title was? Well, what holds you to it? The demonization. The dangers of the dangers demonization, of demonization in dealing with North Korea I see. Is, is, a, is an option that's open to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the Thank first the first thing I want to do is. Uh, sort of defend myself uh, from an, a long and largely complimentary review of my book, which was written uh, by Arthur. And uh, I must say it was the first review, and I was very flattered that you spent your time, but uh, the, you sort of averred that uh, it sounded as though I didn't do anything but play tennis in Japan. <laughs> now, I did play quite a lot of tennis, but uh, the reason that is featured more than it deserves to be is that when I first submitted a draft to CIA, which had to clear my book, uh, they say we want, we want no references whatsoever to Japan. And I, I said, uh, what's going on? And they said, liaison equities. Now that meant that the Japanese are extremely sensitive about anything they are averred to have done in the intelligence field, perhaps because of what they did so for so long during their occupation of Korea. And so, uh, I said, look, my two daughters were born in, in Japan. We lived there for 10 days, for 10 years. I, you know, everybody knows I was there. They said, all right, there can be absolutely no reference to anything you did in the intelligence field. So that's why tennis <laughs> was featured a little more. But I'd like to sort of go behind that a bit and, and tell a couple of things that I would like to have put in. Uh, the agency suffered, I've just finished a book 
called A Spy Among Friends about Kim Philby. And I recommend that to any of you who are interested in the history of intelligence, that is one of the probably the greatest colossal betrayal by anyone that I can think of. And James Jesus Angleton, who was head of counterintelligence at CIA, was absolutely conned by Philby. And when Philby was revealed to have been a, a spy for the Soviet Union for decades, it left Angleton with the feeling that there was no way of, of dealing with the Soviets except through coercion. And so for years, uh, CIA was never allowed to try to recruit a Soviet except through coercion. And uh, I had some personal experience with that in Burma. I was uh, dealing with a, a very susceptible young Soviet who was full of doubts about his own country. He had access to some very interesting stuff, and I got an ice cold, <coughs> an ice cold message from uh, Angleton saying, "You totally misread the situation. He's controlling you, and you will end contact immediately." So at the end of my tour in Burma, uh, having spent seven years in Japan, I was suddenly ordered back to Tokyo. Uh, and I was, that was totally unexpected. And so I uh, asked why, and they said, well, there was a hell of a flap. And we want you to come back and clean it up. And I'm going to tell you what the flap was. Uh, there was a Soviet there who uh, had had some very key, he was with the KGB, he had some very key positions before coming. He was thought to know a great deal about where the Soviets were in terms of building up strategic weapons. And he was very high on the, uh, on the list of, of agency targets. Uh, but Angleton was in charge, and so the only approach that could be taken to his recruitment was the compilation of all kinds of, of evidence of the things he was doing wrong. And so two men went out and spent a number of months gathering information on what this man did. Uh, and uh, he, was, uh, he was a carouser. He, was, uh, he had his hand in the till. Uh, he was uh, noticed for always telling his superiors what they wanted to hear. Uh, and all, full of all kinds of, of uh, things that would, in CIA, would have cost him his job. And so these two guys rented a, an apartment near where the Soviet lived and uh, waited one evening until he was coming down the hall and they jumped out of their room and grabbed him and said, Yuri, or whatever his name was, uh, unless you come and work for us, we're going to tell your bosses that. And then they listed all of the f following things that they knew he had done. And the, the, the Soviet <coughs> was large physically, and he shook them off and turned and shouted at them. He said, you stupid bleeps, we're all the same and then turned and went down the hall. And the two agency guys went back in their apartment and said, well, gee, you know, what do we do next? <laughs> and the Soviet uh, went out, rounded up the Japanese police and brought them back and said, these two guys tried to kidnap me. And so the <coughs> police pounded on the door, fisticuffs erupted between the Japanese police and the two Americans, and it was in every paper in Japan. And so uh, that was when I was called back. And so my first day back in, I called the three years that followed. I was chief of operations in the station at that point. I, I called it my tour in the engine room, and it was as difficult a period as I ever had. And it started out with tea with the chief of liaison of the Japanese National Police, a man named Watanabe, who wore, wore Italian suits and drank Campari soda. And uh, so he had me out for a drink and said, ah, well, Mr. Greg, 
welcome back to Tokyo. We are so glad to have you back. We cannot wait to hear what you have to tell us about professionalism. <laughs> so that was where it started. And uh, I spent a good deal of my time sort of mending fences and rebuilding relationships, which I think I managed to, uh, to do. Uh, but it was a painful tour. It involved uh, the North Koreans seized the Pueblo during that tour. Uh, I was on a task force to decide what we should do to a retaliation of that. Uh, we decided that anything we did militarily would probably relate in the death of the crew, so we did nothing. Uh, the crew <coughs> was, related, was released uh, after 11 very tough months. <clears throat> and I've been on the Pueblo twice. It sits as a sort of the part of North Korea's triumphant naval record against uh, the United States in the, in the river in, in Pyongyang. I hope at some point they will be uh, turned back. Um, so I didn't really get into what, what was going on. The, the struggle for Japan, a great deal of it led in terms of trade, act, trade union activities. The Soviets wanted very much to draw Japan into their orbit, and they were very active uh, in the trade unions, uh, the teachers unions, uh, and they worked very effectively in trying to spawn uh, hateful anti-American propaganda through these evidence. You know, why did they drop the bomb? They killed 80,000 of you in a, in a firebombing of Tokyo. They're unreliable, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was a, a real war of ideas, uh, which I think we, we won. The Soviets uh, refused to turn, return four small islands, Habamai, Shikutan, Kurov, uh, Kurofu, and uh, I forgot the fourth one up north, and that enraged the Japanese. But that was a number, that was a great deal of what I was involved in. Uh, the KGB knew very much who I was. Meg and I had a picture taken by the KGB uh, when we were lined up, and uh, we knew it went back to uh, KGB headquarters. And uh, the last thing I had to do with the with the Soviets was uh, an attempted defection by a very fine young Soviet uh, who wanted to defect, and the. I looked him over and didn't think he was really of any particular intelligence value, and the agency said, we'll meet him and make your judgment and we'll follow your call. So I spent two hours with him talking him out of defecting, uh, because I, I said to him, why do you want to defect? And he said, uh, the Soviet Union's going nowhere. It was a time when uh, Gosigan had a, and Brezhnev had a sort of a weak need dual leadership, and he said, I'm just very disappointed. I don't think we're being led in the right directions at all. And I said, I couldn't agree with you more. And I said, uh, that's what I'm, uh, you know, I think the Soviet Union deserves much better leadership, and I think you have the potential of being one. And I said, I've known a number of defectors, and they're unhappy. Home is home. Uh, and uh, many of the Soviet defectors we had dealt with before had uh, become drunk, some had committed suicide, some had redefected. And so I talked this guy out of defecting, and 20 years later the Berlin Wall came down and I thought of him, and I think he's probably doing an effective role in, the, uh, in, the, in, in Russia today. I hope so. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed writing uh, was about a geisha party that I was taken to, uh, which uh, I don't know how many of you have read the, how many of you have read the book? A few, well, not all. Uh, this was with a cabinet minister whom I had worked very closely with, and he knew we were going home. And so he called me up and said, I want to take you up to, get to a geisha party. And I'd never been to one. I'd been to a lot of other kinds of parties. But anyway, he took me in, into the Yoshiwara district, went into a magnificent old building, removed our shoes, and went upstairs and went into the tatami room, and there, sitting on the floor, were four ladies, all of whom were at least 60 years old. 
and I was then 41. <laughs> and uh, so my, my host was a very sharp guy, and he looked at me, and uh, he said, I think you're going to enjoy this evening. I said, okay. And uh, so we went in and, and sat down with them. And uh, my Japanese at that point was good. And so they, the women immediately began to ask me the usual questions. Uh, how long have you been to Japan? Where did you learn to speak such good Japanese, etc.? And then immediately sort of sotto voce between them were questions they were asking each other. Look how big his feet are. <laughs> Look how long his nose is. Does it have some connection with the length of something else, do you suppose? And they knew that I could understand what they were saying. And so it was up to me to make some kind of rejoinder to this. And I think the rejoinders I made were, were not particularly sophisticated. Uh, and it was, it was a, a real a dem demonstration to the nth degree of Japanese humor, which is totally different from Korean humor. Japanese humor is directed at somebody else. It's always at the expense of somebody else, whereas Korean humor is more like ours. It is self <coughs> and But these, these women uh, just were magnificent teasers. And they, they poked fun at me in every possible way, uh, through card tricks, through questions that made me sound stupid as I answered, uh, in sort of looking at the way I sat awkwardly on the floor, even then saying, well, he thought that probably meant that I had a constant erection. And uh, so it was, I mean, it was no holds barred, and the longer I was there and the more sake I had to drink, the better looking they were. <laughs> and the, it, it really, they were not wearing wigs, they were not wearing kimono, they were in yukata. <coughs> and uh, they were, a couple of them had been f famous and a couple of them had really been beautiful. And the, what, what I found was that the teasing was tremendously erotic. Uh, and I think that is what really, I mean, completely different from the, the Korean approach where, you, you know, you go to a party and, you know, 10 minutes later, Korean woman says, oh my God, you've been the man I've been waiting for. Well, that just blown it. But this was really sophisticated and really entertaining. And it ended on that kind of note uh, when the women looked at each other and then they said, well, I think it's time for him to leave. And uh, he said, please tell him that we've enjoyed talking with him and that we only wish that he was a little younger because he's a bit too old for our taste. <laughs> and so I sashayed out uh, into, into the darkness uh, and I said to my host, that was, that was great. But it, it, really, it, it really brought into focus the power of the, of the geisha. They are brilliant at this. And uh, it's, it's, it's very, very engaging and it's gone on for centuries. So that's some of the stuff that isn't in the book about Japan. Uh, what else? Uh, Korea. Uh, very, very interesting times. I was there first as chief of station and then as ambassador. And that uh, is a rare occurrence. It doesn't happen very often. And uh, it involved me in, in a decision to break the rules and to disobey orders, uh, which I did only once in CIA, but I'm very glad I did it. Uh, the, first, uh, the first thing I was involved in was the kidnapping of Kim Dae-jung who uh, later won the Nobel Peace Prize when he became president of, of, North, of South Korea. And uh, he had been kidnapped by Korean CIA and was in a boat uh, waiting to be thrown into the sea. There's a picture of my first meeting with Kim Dae-jung. I've forgotten what page it's on. And he described for me years later 
how he felt having been kidnapped, having been beaten, spat upon, mm -hmm. tied up, put into a small boat and told we're going to throw you in the sea in the next two or three hours. And he was a devout Catholic and was just praying for his life. And uh, so Phil Habib, the marvelous ambassador, called me in and said, uh, uh, Kim Dae Jung has been kidnapped. Uh, I know how things work around here. They're going to kill him. Uh, and that would be a disaster. Uh, but he said, I think if you can tell me by tomorrow morning who has him, maybe we can stop it from happening. And uh, I was able to do that. And uh, then I like to ask my students, uh, you're the ambassador and you have this information that the number one rival of the sitting president has been kidnapped by his own intelligence service and uh, that he's about to be killed. And how do, you, how do you present that information to the president, who was a very autocratic, very talented, very bright man? And uh, so I, I say, do you think he got in his car and turned on the siren and flew the flag and went up to Blue House and said, Mr. President, I've got to tell you that uh, Kim Dae Jung has been kidnapped by KCIA, and uh, you, if he's killed, that's going to be a disaster. Uh, or do you think uh, he would send a note saying, uh, I have something I really need to discuss with you uh, about the kidnapping of Kim Dae Jung. I'd like to see you in two hours. Now here's a little test. Which which route would you take? How many of you would get in your car and immediately confront him? <laughs> okay, Judge, where would you come out on that? <laughs> well, I would have to know more facts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, she's well, that's the safe. That's the safe answer. Well. Yeah. Well, Habib was, he said a note because he, he realized that, that Pak was a very complicated man and he was being presented with a very complicated issue. How does he save his own butt? Uh, because it was pretty clear that he had probably ordered this to, to be done. Uh, and so what does he say? Who does he blame? How does he sort of crawl out from under. And so his decision was to say that uh, we're very grateful to the United States for informing us that a rogue element uh, of the establishment in, in Korea had done this unthinkable thing of kidnapping Kim Dae-jung. And his, he's now been safely returned to his home. We're all grateful that he's alive because his death would have just been a disaster for Korea. And uh, so that was the word that we put out. Well, the Koreans uh, are wonderful people, and they, they knew the cover story when they saw one. And so they began to push and investigate, and it became very clear very quickly that it had been the Korean CIA that had done it. And so that hit all the papers. And riots broke out on college campuses all over Korea, including uh, Seoul National University, which is the sort of the Yale, Harvard, and Princeton of, of Korea wrapped into one. And so the KCIA, uh, the protest was against KCIA. And so KCIA uh, picked out an American-educated Lincoln scholar, a Korean, arrested him, took him to an interrogation center, and either tortured him to death or to the point where he jumped out a window to end the agony and accusing him of having stirred up the riots, which he had not done. And so uh, we knew what had happened, and I reported it to headquarters. And I then sent a second message two days later saying, I want to protest this because we know what Korean CIA did, and I think for us to sit still and not say anything about it uh, is just uh, something that we should not do because it makes us, in a way, complicit in it. And uh, so I got an ice-cold message from a man with whom I'd had a complicated relationship 
saying, stop trying to save the Koreans from themselves. I love that line. Stop trying to save the Koreans from themselves. That's not your job. Just report the facts. And so I stewed in my own juice for two or three days because I knew I had to do something. <coughs> and so I disobeyed orders. And I went to the chief bodyguard of the president of, of Korea, a man who I knew didn't like the director of CIA, KCIA. And I said, I'm speaking without any authority, uh, but I have a very strong feeling about what happened to Professor Che. You know what happened to him. I know what happened to him. And I just want to say that it makes me very uncomfortable having to deal with an organization of your country that does things like that. That is unworthy of what Korea hopes to become. And I just want to tell you how I feel about it. But as I said, I've not been ordered by Washington to say this. This is just me. And so I went back and felt better, but I had no idea what would happen. But a week later, uh, the head of KCIA, who was the second most powerful man in Korea, was fired. Uh, he went into hiding, uh, was brought back and put into jail. His replacement was a former justice minister who called me in and said, I'm going to be as much against those who break the law on behalf of the government as I will be against the law who break, who break the law against the government. And his first act was a prohibition of torture. And so uh, then the question uh, that I ask my students is, uh, do you think I told CIA, American CIA, what I had done? <laughs> now, what do you think of that? Judge, what would you say about that? <laughs> I need information. <laughs> well, did you care what they thought? Yes. <coughs> it meant my job. Well, I mean, but, I, I yeah. cared up to a point. I mean, yeah. if I really, if, if, if I cared what they thought, I wouldn't have done it in the first place. Yeah. But it worked, so you could report it favorably, right? It had good results. Well, I suppose I could have. What I figured was, that the guy who had said, stop trying to save the Koreans from themselves, he knew me. I think he knew very well that I had broken orders. Uh, I also knew the director of CIA at that point, who was Bill Colby. And so I played out in my mind, being vicarious, okay, this guy's name was Ted Shackley, he's now dead, De Mortius Nil, Missy Bonham, however. Uh, so he goes to Colby and says, that son of a bitch, Greg, has dis disobeyed my orders. And Colby then says, well, what did you tell him not to do? And he said, well, I told him to keep his mouth shut about what KCIA had done to that Professor Che. And he said, well, what did Greg do? Well, he, I don't know what he did, but he blabbed to somebody. And uh, well, then what happened? Well, you know, the head of KCIA was fired. And who did they replace him with? Well, some former justice minister. Well, what has he done? Well, he's prohibited torture. And so, you know, that left Shackley in a very bad position. And so I said nothing, nothing, but felt very good about it. So when I finished up as ambassador, which was, this, this had taken place in 1973, and I finished up as ambassador in 1993, so it was 20 years later. And I came back and CIA approached me and said, you're one of the few people who have been both chief of station and ambassador to the same country. <coughs> and you seem to know quite a lot about how intelligence and foreign policy can be meshed to create more favorable foreign policy, and we would like very much to have you speak to a series of senior people on how you did that. And so I said, I will speak on one condition, and that is that I can include the story of how I totally disobeyed orders from CIA orders in 1973. And it, there was some hemming and hawing, uh, but they finally said, okay. George Tenet was a director at that point. And I spoke to four or five groups of 30 people and told them all the same story just as I've told you. And I finally got a, a very nice note from Tenet saying, thank you very much, your 
what you have said has been very well received. So I, I basically feel, I feel that I was lucky. Uh, I think if you're going to break the rules, you really have to be careful. Now, my Snowden broke the rules. I mean, he tried to blow the whistle, and nobody would pay any attention to him. And so he finally just brought the house down by what, what he did. And it was a terribly mixed bag. Uh, it's both good and uh, good things have been accomplished and bad things also. Uh, so that's, uh, I go to West Point once a year. And uh, I enjoy that. West Point has been transformed in the last 20 years. Uh, they now have a Department of Social Science, 56 topics, including cultural anthropology. It's now rated as one of the better liberal arts colleges in the United States, West Point. And I think this is why they've lost to Navy 12 years in a row, because they've got a tough curriculum. And they really have to spend more time studying than playing football. Anyway. So I told this story to a, a select group of, of people who were about to graduate. And there was a wonderful warrior-faced, hawk-faced uh, cadet there who came up to me <laughs> afterwards. And uh, he said, I don't think I'd have the guts to do what you did. You risked everything. And I said, yes, I did. But uh, I decided it was more important how I felt about myself than how the Korean KCIA felt about me. And he looked me right in the eye, put his hand out, shook his head, turned and walked away. And that was a, that's a striking moment. Because if you're in the military, uh, you're going to have all kinds of opportunities or chances where you are, you are seeing things done in a less than ideal way. And what do you do about it? And uh, whistleblowing in the military is not a very active art. Uh, so I don't know what it'll do, but I'm glad I said it to him, and I think he'll, I think he'll remember it. So those are some of the things that uh, aren't fleshed out fully in the, in the book, because uh, CIA would have been sort of sensitive to it. Uh, but uh, most of the things I, I got in. And uh, I'm very happy with uh, the way it is. It has gone so far. Uh, the last chapter in the book is called "The Dangers of Demonization," and I feel very strongly about that because we, as a country, have a tendency, when we're dealing with somebody we neither like nor understand, to fill our gaps of ignorance with prejudice. We did it against Ho Chi Minh, and we got into a war. I spent four years in the war. Uh, fought a war against Vietnam we never should have. Uh, we, we demonized Saddam Hussein, who was a horrible man. But to justify that war of choice in 2003, we, uh, the Bush administration said he's got weapons of mass, of mass destruction and he's uh, in bed with Al-Qaeda. So he's got to go. And neither of those things were true. Uh, I went to a great conference at Ditchley in, in the UK Boy, that's a great institution. And it was the, the, the largest gathering of spooks that I've ever been part of. And the, the question was, how did we both blow it on, on going into Iraq? And there was the head of MI6 there, the head of MI5 there, I mean, just all kinds of people. And uh, the, the answer was that, that uh, we just didn't do our homework uh, and that uh, we didn't really, really take a hard look at, at Saddam Hussein. Uh, we, we had demonized him. He's a SOB. I mean, he's awful. He's got to go. We didn't look at the fact that he was totally secular. Uh, he was a brute. I had a wonderful Iraqi woman as a student at Williams two years ago. And she said, my mother got her PhD in Baghdad University uh, in engineering without ever putting on a veil. And so he... He was one of those people, uh, you know, talking with you, Judge, about, about what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I went to the one time I went to Yugoslavia, it was when they had the rotating prime ministership every two months. And Tito had been enough of a brute to hold the thing together. And when he was gone, you could just see it falling apart. And I think Saddam Hussein, in a way, was, did the same thing in, in Baghdad. And uh, his removal has led to all kinds of, 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 of chaos.
chaos. Um, so uh, I think that we've also demonized Kim Jong Un. Uh, we don't like his haircut. Uh, we, you know, he he invited this nutcase of a of a rebounder to uh, North Korea. Well, why did he do that? Well, I, he did that because he couldn't get Michael Jordan to go. He was a big Chicago Bulls fan, and he wanted Michael Jordan, and Jordan said hell no, and he wanted Scotty Pippen, and Scotty Pippen said hell no, and so finally, what's his whatever his face his name is, Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman said okay. And Rodman is a drunk, uh, but he actually said some very sensible things. He said he's, a, he's an intelligent young man and he wants to talk to the United States. And uh, sooner or later, we're, we're going to have to do that. But uh, you know, coming from Dennis Rodman, it didn't have much, it didn't have much traction. Um, so we have the, uh, this, this problem of, of, of demonization. And uh, I've been to North Korea six times. And uh, the North Koreans know who I am. They dropped leaflets denouncing me when I was ambassador to South Korea because they knew I had been chasing them around unsuccessfully uh, for years. And I told them on my first trip there that uh, you're the longest running failure in the history of American intelligence. And when I say that, I'm referring not only to CIA's inadequacies, but our collective lack of intelligence in, in, in knowing how to deal with these people. Uh, I make no excuses for their human rights situation, which is horrendous. Uh, but when people say, why do you keep fooling around with them? I said, my experience is that totalitarian regimes, which North Korea is one, change, it, change only when they feel it is in their interest to change. And that China began to change after Nixon reached out to Mao. Uh, when Mao's hands were dripping with the blood of 20 million people killed in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the Soviet Union began to change after Bush and Gorbachev went to Malta. And, uh, and, and Bush, to his great credit, as he said, refused to dance on the wall. He didn't want to make it any more difficult for Gorbachev than it already was to try to move Soviet, the Soviet Union in a different direction. Uh, I have to be more careful than I have been in saying these things so that people don't think that I'm cozying up uh, to the North Korean. And Paul, Hill, Paul Healy and I were talking about this because that's something we have to be very careful about that. Making clear that we, we recognize the shortcomings of, of the North Koreans and the reason that we want to talk to them is we feel that that's the only way to get them to change without fighting them. Uh, and so, I asked that uh, an op-ed that I, I was asked to write an op-ed by the Korea Times, which I wrote on su Sunday, and uh, I sent it. I think some of you have it, and uh, I contrast what is going on in in Europe uh, after the actions in in France, where uh, there is absolutely no civility between the establishment and the forces attacking it, and there is just hostility, confusion, rage, uh, and uh, the, the question of what motivates young men to do what these men did is beginning to be looked at. And a few voices from the Muslim community are beginning to be raised saying what these men did is not, uh, is not Islam. And they need to be controlled, they need to, need to be dealt with. We need an awful lot more of that. Uh, and I said, in contrast, there, Kim Jong-un, in his New Year's speech, speaking personally, said, I would like to meet with, uh, Park, with uh, Kim Park Geun-hye, the president, female president of South Korea. And she has responded, saying, uh, I would be willing to meet with him without preconditions. And uh, I think that the Koreans are smart enough when they look at what intelligence services and societies in Europe are having to cope with and will have to cope with over the coming years in terms of dealing with uh, is Islamic fundamentalism, which has been motivated by past colonial activities by the, uh, particularly the French in Algeria, uh, that the North Koreans speak the same language, they have a hotline, uh, they've had sporadic civility between 
uh, each other. And as uh, President Kim Dae Jung used to say to me, uh, we have a history going back 5,000 years, and the division of less than a century doesn't change people that much. So I think the stage is set for the North and South Koreans to reach out to each other, uh, which will set them apart from what is going on in Europe. And uh, that if they do that, I hope very much that the United States government will be supportive of this. And I think if those things were to happen, that the situation on the Korean Peninsula would be, could be markedly changed for the better by the end of this year. But the ball is essentially in the Korean court at this point. Uh, because there's, uh, there's absolutely zero political benefit to, to President Obama reaching out to North Korea. I think he's played all his cards in that direction by his excellent decision reaching Cuba. And I think the right wing would go absolutely apeshit if he also did something with, uh, with North Korea, pardon my bad language. Uh, so he's not going to he's not going to do anything with with North Korea unless the South Koreans and the North Koreans reach out and show some real signs of moving toward reconciliation. And I hope very much that that will happen. I don't know how long I was supposed to talk. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Will you take a couple of questions? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so I, thank you for your attention, and I enjoyed saying what I said. Yes. May I, may I push out? Um, well. It, um, in the past seven days, uh, the, uh, the, there was a the satellite intelligence that the, the, the latest development in, in, uh, uh, in North Korean weaponry has been a, seemingly a, um, the beginnings of a ballistic uh, and, and intercontinental capacity with, the, uh, with these tubes in the, in the conning tower, one of their diesel uh, subs. Um, but it, it, it raises that perennial question in my mind. It, it, early we were talking um, to um, uh, Hall, who's been there, that, that North Korea is essentially an ox cart society. Um, <coughs> the, the stature is, uh, you know, feet shorter uh, in the north than it is in the yeah. south. Nut and malnutrition is written etched into the faces of the whole population. D with that as the what has to be the base, how do how do they sustain? And where do have they got this? Uh, purported sophistication in uh, in technology and, and particularly in in weaponry it, it's it, it's incredulous that they the, the, the two things can coexist in the same country well it does uh, and they they do have a certain amount of, of income from uh, they're selling a lot of coal to China uh, and they are uh, they are determined that the last time I was there uh, Ri young ho who was formerly their ambassador to the UK, uh, said to me, the American bomber, the B-29, is etched in Korea's, North Korea's DNA because the B-29 was the bomber that we used to absolutely flatten most of the cities of North Korea. So that when you fly a B-52 at us, when we know it has nuclear weapons on it, it, it hits us rather hard. And so we are, we are absolutely going to continue developing a nuclear deterrent uh, until we are convinced that you have no intention of attacking us. And uh, he said, we, aren't going to, we won't use it first because if we did, you would absolutely obliterate us. But we've looked carefully at who you attack and who you do not attack, and you don't attack countries with nuclear weapons. And so that's, their, that's what they're doing. And I, we also, at this, this trip that I took in February, we, we talked with their economic planners. They developed North Korea, or divided into thir 13 zones. They said, this is, the, this is the kind of thing we want to do, but we know nothing about tax incentives. We know nothing about how to attract uh, foreign investment. We don't know how to draw, draw up contracts. We don't know the role of law. We need help. And so PCI, with the Pacific Century Institute, and, and I are, have been helping in small ways. We had a conference in Hong Kong with a man named Jerry Cohen, who's trying to introduce China to the concept of law. And uh, we had some North Korean lawyers come down to Hong Kong, and he talked to them about the role law should play. Uh, we also, in China, uh, gave some training to young North Korean scientists 
uh, trying to acquaint them with the standards, scientific standards, to which they would have to adhere if they were going to function in the outside world. So I think they're serious about trying to change, trying to attract uh, foreign investment, uh, but uh, we still are stuck on this, uh, uh, you know, complacency or whatever they call strategic patience. Uh, we won't talk to them because, oh no, they've betrayed us in the past and we bought that horse before and it doesn't work. But there doesn't seem to be anybody in Washington who is saying, hey, you ought to change. And I, I understand that. I think John Kerry is uh, absolutely snowed under with all the things that he's trying to do. And uh, there is just no political pressure whatsoever for Obama to do anything about North Korea. So I think it's going to go lie fallow until there's another president. Yeah, anything else? Yes. Um, backing up to Saddam Hussein, um, George Tenet famously advised George W. Bush that weapons of mass destruction was a slam dunk. Um, uh, at that point, I think Bush was pretty solidly surrounded by the neocons. And I wonder if you have any insight into why <laughs> Tenet got it so wrong um, or was he just playing to this political atmosphere that surrounded George W. Bush? I think you've made the case pretty well. I think I've, I've met Tennant a couple of times. He was a hail fellow well met. Uh, I, those whom I've talked to who know him said if there's any one thing he ever said that he regrets saying it was that. Uh, but I think that uh, it's easy to get carried away where there is tremendous tension about an, an issue and you know what the president wants to hear. And so I think it's, it's only the best people who can resist saying something that you know will go over tr with tremendous clout in a, in a, in a room of, of busy men. Jamie Mishik. Yes. Well, uh, at this conference in the UK that I mentioned, uh, Jamie Mishik was there. She was the number one female in CIA. She was director of the deputy director for intelligence. And uh, thank you for reminding me, Meg. Uh, and Dick Cheney had been out uh, poring over the intelligence at, at CIA. And there was a lot of intelligence coming out of Libya about why Gaddafi had made the decision to give up his nuclear weapons. And there was speculation that he had done it, maybe he had done it because he had seen what had happened to Iraq and he didn't want to have it happen to him. And so Cheney got some of that and wanted to have it declassified out of context in isolation. And Mishik said absolutely not. That, was not the central thrust of the report. And so he went to uh, the director, who was one of the worst we ever had, and he called, uh, he, he called Jamie in and said, uh, Vice President wants you to declassify that report. She said, I will not. And he said, you're fired. And so that's the, that's the cost of, of, of trying to tell truth to power when power doesn't want to hear the truth. And that's more often the case than not. Uh, I mean, the best intelligence, in my experience, is usually that which says you're on the wrong track. And that's the most important kind of thing you can produce, but it's the least welcome thing you can possibly produce. And that's what, one of the reasons it makes the life of an intelligence officer usually pretty difficult. Yes? Uh, you alluded to the fact that we have gotten into some wars because we haven't done our homework. Yeah. I happen to agree with what you say. And I've, I've been pretty embarrassed over the, my, as I get older, with some of our leadership and some of the decisions they make that get our young people into wars, get us as countries into wars. Uh, Vietnam and Iraq, I think, are good examples. Why do you think we as a country, we choose our leaders, our leaders let us down very commonly when it comes to making these huge decisions about war. I don't think we do a good job 
knowing all the facts before we make those huge decisions. Do you think there's any hope for our country in terms of the future, in terms of us making better informed decisions about things like war? Yes, I do. I Good. think that's a beautifully stated question. Uh, and I think that these decisions, in part, were rooted by our own sense of our exceptionalism. I think we'd won World War II. With the Marshall Plan, we had reconstructed Europe. And here we were, and Britain, to its great credit, slid aside and was, was happy to support us. I mean, usually when, when a number one is, is, is turned over by a number two, there's a hell of a fight. And this was one of the times when there wasn't. And so I think there was a feeling, this is the American century. We know how things ought to be done. This is a great time to be an American. And so then these things come along. And uh, in, in CIA, in the early days, uh, uh, there's a book called uh, The Georgetown Set, uh, which depicts very clearly the, uh, the influence that the Alsop brothers had. Uh, and um, the Dulles brothers, there's a book on the Dulles called The Brothers, and they had a list of eight countries uh, where we were going to overthrow the government. Uh, and the first one was Iran, which, which worked. It was one of the CIA's great successes. Uh, number two was Guatemala, where we put a butcher in place of a suspected leftist. And third was Cuba, where the shit hit the fan. And I think they tore up their list at that point. But we still have the perception or the tendency when we see something going on that we don't like, we can sort of say, hey, we can fix that. And, and we also have the best armed forces we've ever had. Uh, and we don't have the, the drag that the draft was. I mean, in, in Vietnam, the, the, the GIs hated being there because they were drafted. And we have now volunteer services, and they've been deployed over and over and over again. But that's what they signed up for. And so I think, too, Obama has sort of hinted at the, the need for us to rethink this sense of exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where this term leading from behind has come from. I don't like it. But he's, uh, but he's trying to say, and a few other people are trying to say, we don't have the answer to every problem that the world faces. And uh, so I, but I think your, your, your doubt is great. But I think we can change things. Well, I appreciate your question. Yeah. Do you have any um, line into the administration now where some of your notions might be heard? No. If there's another administration coming after the next election? I don't know. No. I don't. I mean, that's, I can't. <coughs> I keep doing what I'm doing because I feel I, I, I want to do it, and I think it needs to be done. And Hall, you, I think you're motivated by the same thing. There, there isn't a very large cheering section for people who are trying to, uh, you know, <laughs> do things. Uh, just to, a funny note: I went to North Korea with Ted Turner, and uh, Ted was uh, interested in setting up sort of a peace zone in the DMZ, as he did, I think, in South Africa. And uh, traveling with Ted Turner is a circus. Uh, he has a sort of a rotating list of beautiful women who he, he sort of calls up and says, hey, I'm going somewhere, and would you like to come along? And sometimes it's even Jane, occasionally. And the, the one he had on this trip was, uh, she had a, a fishing ranch on a river in, uh, in the south, and I heard somebody she was bragging to somebody about what a great shot she was with a pistol. And uh, so I asked her, I said, why, why are you so interested in that? She said, did you see the film Deliverance? Uh, and that was a film where four or five guys go down a river in a, in a small boat and they get attacked by ruffians and unspeakable things happen. And uh, I said, yeah, I did. She said, my place is on that river. 
and uh, she said, I have a steel door, uh, and uh, I'm a very good shot. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he, and she's very, very smart. She had, uh, she had gone over a long book on, on North Korea and had underlined it and had really made it helpful because Turner does not have long attention spans. Uh, he's a wonderful guy. And I mean, he's just worshipped by CNN. But I mean, to, to travel with him to North Korea was just a circus. And the, uh, the North Koreans were very interested in what he wanted to do. But they said, well, we've got a few other problems that we've got to get over before we can sort of demilitarize the DMZ. But they, uh, they, tr <laughs> they treated him with a great, great courtesy. And it was a, it was a real ball to uh, be traveling with him. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, who's your contact? Do you have a special contact in North Korea who invites you? Uh, and what do you talk about? Well, I'm invited by people in the foreign in the <coughs> Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the the man I've seen most of is Kim Gae Kwan, who is their chief nuclear negotiator, and uh, I. In 2002, I wrote North Korea. George W. Bush had just undone everything that had been done by Bill Perry and Bill Clinton at the end of his term and called North Korea part of the axis of evil. And so everything stopped. Kim Dae-jung, whose life I helped save twice, uh, invited me to his inauguration. And he said, plant the Korea Society flag in North Korea. You haven't done anything with North Korea to speak of. You've done a lot for South Korea, but get involved with North Korea. So I did. And uh, so when everything stopped after George Bush's axis of evil, uh, I found this irrepressible urge to write the North Koreans. And so I wrote uh, Kim Jong-il, whom I'd never met and I never have met. And I said, there are really things we need to talk about. Uh, I said, you're building nuclear weapons. We're moving toward a, a clash, which uh, we must not have. And uh, so there are a number of things I'd like to come to talk to you about. And they knew who I was, and there was no doubt about it. And uh, two weeks later, I was invited to go to North Korea. Now, another question I asked my students, uh, do you think I told the State Department before I wrote the letter? <laughs> I did not. Because if I had told them what I planned to do, I'd have been, they would say, hey, no way. Uh, so what I did tell them, uh, I didn't have no idea what they would say, and they were very pleased. And they sent a, a fluent in Korean young Foreign Service officer who made my life much, much easier. But it's been Kim Gae Gwan whom I have seen on every trip to North Korea. He's their chief nuclear negotiator. And the, on the first trip, I suggested that they return the Pueblo. And uh, they were going to do it until we accused them of having a second approach toward nuclear weapons involving hydrogen, not plutonium. Uh, but I think at one point they will re return that. Uh, and uh, we, we talk about the problems that we have, how can we establish more trust? Uh, they've, they've been interested in the, in the few things we have done to try to give them some training in terms of the, the scientists, and we've helped some doctors, and so forth. So they, they know that we are interested in maintaining a dialogue uh, that we're not making excuses for them, but we're trying to keep channels open so that when there is a change at the policy level, there's some place to start. And Paul, I think you said that's the same kind of thing you're trying to do. And I think it's very much worth doing. After you go to Hanoi, um, does the agency ask you for a report? Uh, it's, it's not Hanoi, it's Pyongyang. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. Pyongyang. Wrong war. Uh, yeah, they did. Uh, George Tennant uh, invited me down, uh, and I earlier on I, I kept the agency informed, but uh, they never asked me to do anything. And if they'd asked me to do something, I would not have, because the I, I'm saying to the North Koreans, I am here. You know my background. 
I tried and failed as an intelligence officer to deal with you, but I'm here to try to establish some kind of dialogue so that we can move forward. But they must certainly believe, whether they tell you or not, that you are still, if not working for the agency, at least uh, liaising with them. Yeah, who knows? I don't ask. But you said they never, you sent, you've never had any reply. You oh yeah, I have sent, I have sent a full report on every trip I have made to the Department of State and the White House, I've had zero feedback. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. Zero. Mm -hmm. I had a phone call from Sung Kim, who's now sort of the Assistant Secretary, and uh, I said uh, he worked for me as Second Secretary, a junior Second Secretary when I was Ambassador in Seoul. And so he called me up and I said, Sung, this is the first call I've had from the State Department in over a dozen years. Mm -hmm. So that's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I I don't want to sound too naive here, but I mean, I understand that our foreign policy is never controlled uh, by a commitment to human rights, and I understand, I, and I really appreciated what you said about the American. I you know that we have this, we're trapped in our own vision of exceptionalism, but. Many other countries also have the same vision of us <laughs> that's based on that. And I mean, I wonder what price we're going to pay, you know, in the future with North Korea. Because I, you know, I just don't understand uh, on one level how we can ignore that. And it's not just North Korea, it's all the other countries that have massive human rights violations that if anybody understands what's going on in that country it is the CIA yet they're not committed I mean that's not their job right it's to protect American interests as opposed to making our you know you know I don't exactly know what I'm trying to say here except that I wish that our interests and our commitment to human rights were at times one and the same uh, because it's hard for me to hear you even talk about North Korea and at the same time recognize there's nothing we can do about North Korea uh, that's not, you know, slow, painful, tiny steps. Um, yet we know that that means, you know, a nation of people that are just, I think, living in pretty horrific situation. Well, it's, it's less horrific than it, than it was. Uh, are you looking for a way to get out politely? Yes, we are. We All right, please. Here, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, please. Thank you for coming in the first place. Turn off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the UN put out a report on human rights. Uh, in North Korea, and the leader of that group was an Australian, and he came to report on his report to the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and I was invited to go and listen to him and comment on what I heard him say. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a nice guy, I liked him, and I said, your report covers a number of decades. And I said, were you able to discern any level of change in the intensity or the number of people incarcerated or the severity with which they were treated? And he said, yes. He said, I think things have eased up under Kim Jong-un and we believe there are fewer people in jail or in the gulags than before. Which was very interesting. He hadn't said that in his report. Uh, I then, the North Koreans, seeing what was coming, uh, the North Koreans called me up and said, a guy named Jang, who's an ambassador, said, uh, I would be happy to talk on the record about human rights if you can arrange a place for me to do it. So I called the Council on Foreign Relations. They said, yes, bring him over. And so over he came and he, he gave his, his pitch, which was, uh, he, he was essentially denial. 
uh, saying we have prisons as you have prisons, but we I know nothing about the gulags, I know nothing about the kind of treatment that you're describing. And he was uh, attacked very severely by people saying, you know, who sent you? Who do you think you are? How do you think you can get away with that kind of crap? And uh, David Sanger was there of the New York Times, and he spoke up and asked some questions and wrote, I thought, a very fair article the next day saying that here was this Jang trying to make the North Korean case on human rights failing, but at least he, he left open the possibility of allowing a, di a delegation from the, the council visiting the, the gulags. So I took Jang out for lunch or dinner afterwards, and I said, well, you stood up very well. You kept your cool. And he said, well, it was on the record, and so I had to say what I would have been told to say by my government. And I said, well, what would you have said if you were off the record? And he said, I would have said that we in the Foreign Service find it very difficult to get the people running our prison system to make the changes that we feel are necessary. So they have a stovepipe kind of government. Mm -hmm. And here are the Foreign Service people living in the outside world, seeing the impact of what these gulags do, do, but unable convincingly to say to the people back home, you've got to change. But it's a, it's a start. But that's about the only, you know, I, I, there's no magic bullet to it. Uh, China slowly changed, and uh, this guy Jerry Cohen uh, that I spoke of had, uh, had a wonderful report on this human rights in China. and saying, really, what's the impact of human rights in China of the recognition by Nixon? And he said it's, it's less than it should have been, but it's certainly more than would have taken place if we hadn't recognized it. So. Donald, you've talked for a long time, but let me ask one final question before we let you collapse. <laughs> Wait a minute, then, hold it. There's a man in the back who hasn't asked a question yet. Oh, let me sorry. <laughs> Uh, North Korea, you know, is, is often referred to as a, a rogue nation or a rogue state, and they supposedly allegedly generate a lot of their hard currency through supposed criminal activities. Uh, one thing I've seen listed is currency counterfeiting. Uh, could you comment on some of those potential criminal activities and at I've what level? I no longer have any access to intelligence information. It's probably true. I don't know the extent to which it's true. Uh, I think the uh, whatever they are doing is not generating an, an awful lot of an awful lot of money. I just don't know how true that is. I'm not in a position to uh, to uh, investigate. But I'm aware. I can't deny it. I can't affirm it. I can't exempt. I can't expand on. It. Yeah, but I know it's there. As a follow up to that, the recent uh, Sony hacking. Yeah. I'm wondering. What your thoughts are on how much impact they, that may have on potential future relations with North Korea? Well, what I've said on that is uh, I wrote the State Department immediately and, and said, uh, I think we ought to accept the North Korean offer to jointly investigate this. Because I, I had lunch with the North Koreans after they made that offer, and it had been turned down by the State Department. And I said, is, the, is that offer still open? And they said, absolutely. And I said, well, what would you do if we went to you and said, yeah, we'd like to jointly investigate who did the hacking? Uh, he said, well, we would find out uh, you know, who we have available to talk about that and where, we, where you and we decide that we ought to start looking. And uh, I think that's a very interesting offer. And I have, I have sent my feelings about that to other, other places. I don't know whether that will make any difference or not. But uh, I think, you, you know, we don't know very much about their cyber activities. And, you know, even if that door opened only for a very short period, that would teach us an awful lot that we don't know now. The, North, the South Koreans are the most wired people in Asia. And I think the North Koreans have the same talent. So I think they're perfectly capable of having done some of this. Uh, there's one hacking specialist who says it smells much more like the Russians. And there's a, another one who feels it's largely disgruntled employees from Sony. So who knows? Yes? You, you spent quite a few years um, bringing the Korea Society to greater heights. And then you left, and now you're very much involved with the Pacific Institute. And I wonder whether 
in the last few minutes you might tell us what the Pacific Institute is and does and and why you're there. Okay, it's the Pacific Century Institute. Uh, it was basically founded by a, a very wealthy Korean American named Spencer Kim. Uh, and it is involved in trying to build bridges between the United States and countries with which we've had problems. Uh, Mongolia, Burma, North Korea, China, uh, and uh, that's what they do, that's what we do. And we give an award every, uh, every year, a Building Bridges Award, uh, for people who have worked on very difficult relationships which can be made stronger by sort of building bridges of communication. And uh, it's, uh, Spencer is wealthy and he's committed. And so when he sees something that he feels can be done, he's very good at coming up with seed money saying, if you do this uh, and accomplish it and match what I have given, let's move forward on this. And he has a, he has a very good record on that. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm sort of going to be chairman for a couple of years, and then I, it's time for me to hang up my <laughs> whatever. But uh, I very much enjoy being part of the PCI, because it's, it's quick, uh, it, it can react quickly, and it, is, uh, it has money that it is able to put forward very quickly. Peter wants to say something. Well, Donald, I want to thank you for a fascinating evening. The, um, and Donald's book is Potchard's uh, Fragments of Life Lived in the CIA, the White House, and the Two Koreas. And I'm certainly going to be ordering my copy tomorrow. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you for an absolutely um, fascinating talk. Thank you. And, uh, Please accept a little uh, token of appreciation um, and, uh, for your weekend Thank breakfast table. Thank and uh, thanks, uh, thanks in part go to the Grafton Village Cheese uh, Company and the Rob Family Farm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.